Daniela Rus, um, CCL MIT. I was a computer science and math major uh, in college and uh, one day I attended a talk given by John Hopcroft and in this talk he said that classical computer science was solved. By this he meant that many of the algorithms um, that uh, solved the original graph theoretic problems that were introduced to the community in the 70s had solutions. And then John said it was time for the grand applications and robotics was one of them. And so since I had grown up uh, fascinated by science fiction books and John proposed uh, that I work on robotics with him, I thought it was fantastic and I decided to go to Cornell to work on robots with John. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, John said to me, well, what if we had robots that could make coffee? that could make and fetch coffee. And so I started thinking, what would it take uh, for us to create machines that are able to do the kind of fine manipulation tasks involved in making a perfect cup of coffee? Well, I couldn't solve the coffee challenge as a graduate student, but instead I ended up working on a number of algorithms for fine motion planning for dexterous manipulation. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, most of the robots we had uh, looked like big um, puma arms, they were industrial manipulators, they were not very delicate. Mm -hmm. But human-inspired dexterous uh, robot manipulators were just being introduced and it was really exciting to think about the control and planning aspects of these new types of machines. So at the moment, I have this great dream of making uh, pervasive robots, creating a world where machines can help us with cognitive and physical work, just like uh, computers help us with uh, computational work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, 20 years ago, computation was a task reserved for the expert few because computers were large and expensive and you really needed expertise in order to know what to do with them. But all of that changed with the introduction of the smartphone mm -hmm. and today everyone computes. Mm -hmm. And in fact we uh, depend on computation so much we actually don't even notice it around us. And this raises a very interesting question. In this world so changed by computation, what might it look like with machines helping us with physical and um, cognitive work. And towards this end, I'm interested in developing the science and engineering of autonomy and the science and engineering of intelligence. And here we have to understand that a machine is made out of a body and a brain. For any task we want that machine to do, the machine has to have the body capable of doing the task and the brain capable of controlling the body to do the task. And then the machine has to be easy to interact with. Mm -hmm. And so to me, advancing the science and engineering of autonomy uh, means um, making progress on robot bodies or machine bodies, mm -hmm. making progress on machine brains, and making progress on the interaction between machines and people. And let me say just a little bit about each one of them. With respect to machine bodies, uh, most of today's uh, robots are inspired by the human form. Um, they are either industrial manipulators or humanoids, or they are machines on wheels. And these machines have been around for nearly 60 years. Mm -hmm. And um, these machines do extraordinary feats uh, on assembly lines in factories. Yet these machines remain isolated from people because they are big and heavy and difficult to work with. And this raises an interesting question. What should the machines of the future that are safe to be around, that are adaptive, uh, that can uh, exist in human-centered environments, what should they look like? And so I think it is a good time for us to challenge what our idea of a robot and a machine is and to advance 
um, new types of approaches to making uh, robot bodies, uh, to look at uh, new materials. Uh, we can make robots out of hard metals and plastics, but also out of silicon and other um, soft materials, out of paper, out of food. We have a wide range of possibilities. And also, uh, going back to the idea that the shape influences function, what should all the shapes be? Uh, can we imagine creating machines that are inspired by all natural shapes um, and even by shapes we see in the built environments? Uh, we can in fact imagine breathing life into many of the objects that surround us uh, to help us with monitoring and with small um, activity, with small physical tasks. So I would like to see the next 60 years of robotics focused on creating uh, machines out of a wider body of materials in a wider body of, uh, of shapes and I really imagine a Cambrian explosion uh, in the introduction of machines in our lives and altogether this will take us to world with machines supporting us uh, with physical work. Well, look, I believe that AI and robotic technologies uh, can have so many applications, can contribute to so many aspects of our lives. And here I would like to uh, make a distinction between three different but interrelated fields. Mm -hmm. um, one is robotics, and robotics puts computation in motion, gives machines the ability to move in the world. The other one is artificial intelligence. And with artificial intelligence, we give machines the ability to reason. Uh, we give machines uh, human-like characteristics, maybe to see, to hear, to reason, to play games uh, like mm -hmm. humans. And machine learning cuts across robotics and artificial intelligence. And today with machine learning, we are able to give machines the ability to um, use data uh, to um, make predictions and to find patterns uh, that the human eye cannot see. Mm -hmm. Together, these three technologies have huge potential to empower us. With these technologies, we can ensure that there will be no road accidents. Uh, we will be able to transport people and goods much faster. We will be able to better uh, diagnose, monitor and treat disease. Uh, we will be able to uh, to provide people with universal com communication. In other words, we, we will be able to provide people to, with uh, the ability to communicate instantly with each other, no matter what language they speak. Um, we will be able to provide universal uh, democratized education. We will keep people's information private and safe. Altogether, I imagine a world where machines can take care of the low-level routine tasks uh, while giving people the ability to focus on um, high-level strategic critical thinking. So I used to love the books of Jules Verne mm -hmm. and I also loved the movies of Jacques Cousteau. Okay. Okay, but I actually didn't think, didn't even dream about making my own machine until years later. And years later, uh, when I became a professor, I met a student who also loved the books of Jules Verne and the movies of Jacques Cousteau. And then we decided to make a robot together. Our version of the undersea exploratory. <laughs> and we called this robot Amour. And mm -hmm. Amour stood for Autonomous Modular Optical Underwater Robot. But in fact, making this robot uh, was, was really about love. This robot had a lot of very innovative uh, technologies embedded in it. It was the first helicopter-like hovering robot. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a small robot that you could pack in a suitcase and take it with you on field trips. Um, this robot could take beautiful pictures, uh, color accurate pictures, mm -hmm. um, which were enabled by a very innovative approach to imaging in water. And with this robot, we could also transmit uh, HD TV quality uh, video. And we were really excited about this robot. So since you asked, let me tell you the rest of the story. Yes. <laughs> okay, so it took us about three years to make this robot. So one very hot summer day, we were in Singapore and uh, we had just finished um, a research trial for our sponsor. And then we decided to uh, 
really see how far um, and how strong this robot was. And in fact, there was a team from Singapore who was on the same boat with us. And we thought we might play Hunt for Red October with our two robots. <laughs> well, um, we decided to take down all the safety features of our robot to give it more juice. And we giggled when the Singapore team attached their robots to a fishing line. So we sent off these two robots and then we waited and waited and waited. But our robot never came back. <laughs> we lost a moor and we were devastated. And then um, we realized that in science, usually great failures teach you great lessons. And also it is the case that in science, the first copy of an invention takes much longer yes. than subsequent copies. Mm -hmm. So this was in May, it was after ICRA. And um, we went back to the lab, we grounded ourselves for the summer. And by the end of the summer, we had three improved copies of this robot. And interestingly, as we watched this robot do the flips and move um, uh, in water, uh, we, we felt like uh, we wanted more. Uh, we wanted an even better, even more agile robot. And that was actually a bridge from, uh, from our hard-bodied Amu robot to the soft underwater robots we have built, the soft uh, robot fish. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting uh, is to remember that initially it took three years to build Amur. Then it took us three months to build three improved copies of Amur. And today in the lab, we can build the soft robot fish uh, in a matter of a few um, days. Yeah. And this kind of, this rapid change of technology, this rapid pace uh, of technology uh, is very similar to what we have seen with computation. And this is why I am so excited about a future with um, hu uh, machines for human-centered environments, machines that are much more capable, machines that are delicate and soft and that can, uh, can help support people. Now with these machines, uh, we can go to places where humans can, uh, cannot go. And uh, we can peek on the secret lives of, uh, of animals, of natural systems. Uh, but with these machines, uh, we can also go into, um, into human environments, into your apartment. And I, I like to think of a time when uh, such robots can help us with cooking. They already help us with cleaning, but maybe they help us with cleaning in more uh, substantive ways. In other words, it's back to this idea of, uh, of empowering these machines to take care of the routine tasks that um, take time mm -hmm. and we do not like to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, with these machines, we can also improve healthcare. So, for instance, at MIT, uh, we are working on an autonomous wheelchair. And we are very excited about the possibility of using this wheelchair for rehabilitation. Uh, in our conversations um, with hospitals, we learned that uh, a large fraction of the time a rehabilitation doctor has with a patient is spent uh, moving the patient in the wheelchair, first to bring to the gym and then to send back to the hospital room. Now imagine if we had an autonomous wheelchair and, um, and uh, all of that time that is spent in transition can now be spent uh, by, the, by the doctor applying expertise and by the patient uh, improving um, his or her well-being. So I think there's so many opportunities. It's super exciting. I think it is very important to communicate the possibilities of uh, technology to the general public. Uh, technology can truly be a vector for positive good mm -hmm. and it could truly help everyone. But we have to get those stories out and uh, Right now, we as technologists spend our time developing the technology and, uh, and I think it's important for us to begin to get out and start uh, explaining to people how technology can help them. Uh, there are so many ways uh, in which 
uh, people can, uh, can benefit. In every profession where there are low-level tasks, where there are data tasks, uh, technology can help. Uh, if uh, the professions have uh, low-level, simple, uh, physical tasks, technology can help. However, technology is not yet ready to help with expertise, uh, with uh, deep communications, uh, nor with uh, complex tasks in um, unpredictable environments. Mm -hmm. It is much easier to send a robot to Mars today than it is to get that robot to clear your tabletop. Yes. Um, but we are working on improving those capabilities. So for instance, uh, with the use of technology, uh, we can imagine teachers um, getting help grading papers and uh, therefore spending more time uh, interacting with the students and providing more personalized education. Uh, we can imagine uh, cities providing better support and um, security and safety for people. Um, I like to imagine a future of autonomous transportation uh, which, will prov which will ensure that there will be no road fatalities. And furthermore, we'll ensure that our parents and grandparents have a higher quality of life in their retirement, and all of us will have the ability to go anywhere, anytime. I, I don't believe it's a matter of if, I believe it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we will all benefit. Uh, transportation is indeed on its way uh, to become like a utility, available mm -hmm. anywhere, anytime. I am very excited about communicating uh, with the public about the benefits of technology. I really see technology as a vector for the greater good and I really see technology as, uh, uh, as being able to support everyone. And uh, I'm concerned when I, um, when I read in the popular press stories about um, negative effects of technology and uh, dramatic um, uh, negative impacts. Many stories uh, we uh, read about uh, today uh, instill fear rather than dreaming on people. And I would love to, con to do my share uh, to contribute uh, to how people dream about how their lives can be made better by technology. Um, there are things we can do today, uh, but there is a lot of hopeful, wishful thinking for the future. Uh, however, I believe that um, a future with machines supporting us more extensively with cognitive and physical work uh, is not that far off. You see, usually when I tell people what I do, I get two types of reaction. So some people get nervous and uh, start cracking jokes about Skynet and ask me when they're going to lose their job. And other people get really excited and say, when is my car going to be self-driving? <laughs> because it's not this year. Right. Um, <laughs> <A new splash. laughs> so I think that it is important to understand the fears of that first group of people and provide alternatives for how to see things differently. And this starts with understanding that everything we do, AI, robotics, machine learning, is about creating new tools. So every, all these tools are are just tools by the people for, la for the people. And like any other tools, they are not inherently good or bad. They are what we choose to do with them. Mm -hmm. And I believe we can choose to do incredible things. We have had so much impact uh, from technologies. Uh, if you think about it today, doctors connect with patients and students connect with teachers that are thousands of miles away. We have robots that help packing uh, in factories. We have 3D printing that creates customized goods. We have networked centers, uh, sensors that monitor facilities. Uh, we are really surrounded by a world of opportunities. And these opportunities are only going to grow bigger uh, when we consider the impact of the new wave of technologies and I really like to think of a world where routine tasks are taken off your plate. Mm -hmm. um, I like to imagine robots um, delivering fresh uh, produce at my doorsteps. 
um, on a daily basis. Um, I, um, I like to think about the possibility of uh, garbage uh, cans that take themselves out mm -hmm. and automated infrastructure <laughs> that supports uh, removing them. I like to think about intelligent assistants that may be embodied or not, that support us um, with all sorts of tasks to ensure that we uh, work efficiently and we live well. There are many jobs that exist today um, that people don't want. There are so many job openings and there are, uh, there are openings in, uh, in places like doing recycling, very important for the planet, um, handling um, cold foods. Even um, fulfillment centers and shipping centers have trouble hiring enough people and there are a lot of openings. Today there is a mismatch between where there are job openings, uh, what people's skills are and what people want to do. And I believe that there are jobs that should be done by machines uh, because it's not, they're not attractive to people. And then we have to think about how do we match uh, people's uh, training with the machines. But you see today, and I believe this will continue to be in the future, it's not about people or machines doing a job. It's about people and machines uh, supporting each other. The, the, the machine uh, is a tool, uh, it's an intelligent tool, um, and the machine can do some things much better than people. Mm -hmm. Machines have chips and speed and strength, but people have hearts and wisdom and delicacy. And so if you think about a world where it's people and machines working together with machines doing what they're best at and people doing what they're best at, um, that will be a better world. Now, with respect to jobs, I, um, it is true that the jobs are changing and, um, and uh, there is no going around this and this is uh, bringing a certain level of uncertainty and fear uh, to people and this uh, fear um, is, um, is, is meaningful. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there is a lot of reason for optimism. So for instance, um, the World um, Economic Forum uh, released a report that talked about the possibility of some 75 million jobs uh, going away in the next few years, but 133 million jobs coming. Mm -hmm. And I think we as people have, um, we are much better at thinking about what might go away than at imagining what could come. Mm -hmm. And if you think about where we were in, in this world 10 years ago, so 10 years ago is, is a short amount of time. I remember that time very clearly. Well, 10 years ago, we had no smartphones, we had no cloud, we had no social networking. Mm -hmm. And so let us think about all the different jobs that were enabled because of the advent, uh, advancements uh, in, uh, in these technologies. And these are jobs at all, uh, at all levels. And so I think when you, when you consider a profession, um, it is better to think about which tasks within that profession will be automated rather than which professions will go away. Because in every profession, we spend time doing different tasks. We spend time applying expertise. We spend time managing others. Uh, we spend time doing stakeholder interactions and communicating. Uh, we spend time doing data collection and data analysis. We spend time doing predictable physical work and unpredictable physical work. And the technologies we have today are good at automating the predictable physical work and the data tasks. If those tasks were to receive support from machines, we would have much more time to devote um, to the higher level tasks. Mm -hmm. So self-driving cars is an excellent example. So in autonomous driving, the idea is that we yield our, uh, the control power for the vehicle um, to the to the machine 
and uh, this is this is really kind of exciting to me. But it's better to think about this transfer of power as having a friend uh, that is supporting you in the car, maybe watching your back on a treacherous piece of the highway, or maybe in the future uh, the cars will even. Um, uh, keep track of our personal life and know that maybe we forgot to call um, our mother because it was her birthday and by uh, driving, by taking over control of the vehicle, um, the car would make the placement of that call very natural and easy. Um, so of course uh, level 5 autonomous driving is some years away. Uh, there are however intermediate technologies that we can imagine introducing in the meantime. In our work at MIT, we are exploring um, something we call parallel autonomy, or a guardian approach to driving, mm -hmm. um, where in fact the human remains in control of the car, uh, but a parallel autonomy system watches over the human's shoulder uh, and uh, and has a great sense of everything that is happening in the world around the car uh, with much uh, greater precision and much wider scope of view than what we are able to do um, with a naked eye. Mm -hmm. And so such a system could intervene, much like anti-lock brakes intervene today, uh, but such a system could intervene uh, in, um, in logical ways uh, to prevent road accidents. And uh, so while we are developing the technologies that take us towards level 5 autonomy, uh, we can use such parallel autonomy systems uh, with a spirit of uh, do no harm, uh, which is the same spirit that uh, we have, for instance, in medicine. Mm -hmm. This trope of the guardianship. It sounds to me that this is a philosophy that empowers the individual human by virtue of the enhancements that are afforded through the tool. Exactly. Is that a fair interpretation? Do you exactly, think? exactly. Are there other examples of tools that you think will empower an individual human or groups by virtue of, of this motif or this guiding principle of do no harm? Many examples. The one I really like uh, is a recent study from medicine. Um, so in the study, doctors and machines were asked to look at scans of lymph node cells and classify them as cancer or not cancer. Human doctors made 3.5 percent error as compared to the AI systems which made 7.5 percent error. But when the doctors and the machine worked together the error dropped down to 0.5 percent. This is 80 percent improvement in the performance of the system. And are you able to disambiguate whether or not the system and the doctors were making different errors? Actually, I don't know the, the answer to that question because it's not my study. Yeah. Uh, okay. But what is, uh, what is, uh, what is exciting um, is to see how humans and machines working in tandem sure. can uh, complement uh, each other. And today, uh, these systems are deployed in the most advanced uh, hospital centers in the world. But imagine a world where all doctors have access to these systems. Imagine a world where an overworked doctor or a rural doctor uh, who do not have time to keep up with the latest and greatest uh, clinical trials uh, has access to such systems that can provide them on demand, just in time, mm -hmm. with the most relevant information uh, for the patient uh, they, are, um, they are working with. Mm -hmm. With these systems, uh, the patients will benefit from the world's uh, greatest uh, discoveries, especially the ones that are most suitable to their condition. So here's how I think about this. Um, the deployment of any kind of autonomous system, whether it's a robot or um, a software system, uh, that deployment requires uh, a certain checks and balances to ensure consumer confidence in it. And right now we don't really know how to approach uh, this question. Uh, but one idea is to consider certain attributes that are important and critical 
to assess the performance of the system. So what might those attributes be? Well, we want the uh, decision of the system to be interpretable and explainable. We want the system to be fair. We want, um, if the system is uh, rooted in data, uh, we want to be able to track the data provenance to ensure that the data is good and we want to be able to assess in some sense the bias in the data because with today's techniques uh, if you train something uh, with a body of data that has bias the system uh, will operate with the same bias. Or, or scale it. <laughs> so there are, there are certain attributes that are general and maybe we can create a driving test for each of these attributes for the systems we want to deploy. But now here's the thing. In each industry that um, might adopt uh, the use of uh, uh, AI, machine learning and robotics, uh, we would have to instantiate those attributes uh, to the industry. So for instance, for interpretability and explainability, in finance, uh, you might have to be able to provide an explanation for why the loan was not granted. Mm -hmm. In medicine, you might have to provide an explanation for why the diagnosis. Uh, in transportation, if there is an accident, uh, what was the sequence of uh, uh, evaluations uh, that led to that particular behavior from the vehicle? Um, so there are a lot of super important and super exciting ideas to consider. And what I firmly believe is that this requires conversation between multiple stakeholders, between the technologists who are creating the technology and understanding its scope and limitations, um, industry leaders uh, and business leaders who want to use the technology, and policy makers uh, who know how to create the social uh, uh, norms uh, that enable the safe use of technology. A machine that has the same level of intelligence as a human? Perhaps. <laughs> Everyone interprets this a little bit differently. But. Well, today we are making a lot of progress on what we call narrow AI. In other words, we have point solutions to problems. Uh, we are um, celebrating uh, the feat of uh, AlphaGo, uh, who beat uh, the Grand Go Master, which is truly a technological achievement. Uh, but I will say that the AlphaGo program will not be able to play poker or even go fish with you. Um, whereas, if I explain the rules to you, uh, you, you would just uh, pick them up in no time. We are in my opinion, very far from general artificial intelligence. Uh, in order to understand the path towards more capability in our machines, we really have to develop the science and engineering of intelligence. And today, we don't really know how the brain works. But by bringing computer scientists, artificial intelligence researchers, uh, neuroscience and brain and cognitive science researchers together, uh, we will have an opportunity to advance our understanding of the brain, uh, which means our understanding of life and of each other. And perhaps that understanding could translate into new types of algorithms that will render our machines more capable. Uh, there are significant limitations in uh, the solutions we have for our machines today. Um, we have uh, systems that require millions and millions of manually labeled examples in order to get trained and to work. But uh, we don't need millions of examples in order to pick up a new concept, to pick up uh, abstraction, in order to uh, connect um, our um, our uh, uh, reasoning about the world to symbols and abstraction. It will take a long time to get there.